Good morning. Uh, we're glad to see you here in this cold, snowy November morning. Um, today, we'd like to thank and honor our veterans for preserving our freedom um, and for serving their country. And so with that, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, giver of life, author of all things good, Lord, we give thanks today for our nation's veterans. Lord, we honor them for their faithful service in defending and preserving our freedom. God, we're so grateful for all those who serve during times of peace, standing ready, bravely waiting for their call of duty. Lord, we are grateful for those who serve during times of unrest, enduring conflict and bearing the physical and mental wounds of war. Lord, we ask that you bless them, heal their wounds, and give them peace. Lord, we thank you for our beloved veterans, these generations, past and present. We honor and thank these men and women who have so graciously served in our armed forces. Father, may we never forget what our country has asked of them and what they have given in return. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise for our national anthem. On the 11th hour of the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, an armistice between Germany and the Allied nations came into effect. One year later, on November 11th, 1919, Armistice Day was commemorated for the first time. In 1919, President Wilson proclaimed the day should be filled with solemn pride and the heroism of those who fought and died in the country's service. There were plans for parades public meetings, and a brief suspension of business activities at 11 a.m. In 1926, the United States Congress officially recognized the end of World War I and declared the anniversary of the armistice should be commemorated with prayer and thanksgiving. The Congress also requested that the President should issue a proclamation calling upon the officials to display the flag of the United States on all government buildings on November 11, and inviting the people of the U.S. to observe the day in schools and churches with appropriate ceremonies of friendly relations with all other peoples. An act was approved on May 13, 1938, which made November 11th in each year a legal holiday known as Armistice Day. This day was originally intended to honor veterans of World War I. A few years later, World War II required the largest enlistment of servicemen in the history of the United States and the American forces fought in Korea. In 1954, the Veteran Service Organizations urged Congress to change the word armistice to veterans. Congress approved this change, and on June 1, 1954, November 11th became a day to honor all American veterans, wherever and whenever they had served. On Memorial Day, 
America remembers its war dead. More than two million men and women have heroically and courageously given their lives for their country since its founding. From the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1775. To Gettysburg in 1863. To the Battle of Amain in 1918. To Pearl Harbor in 1941. The Battle of Porkchop Hill in 1953. U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. The invasion of Grenada in 1983. To Desert Storm in 1991. To Iraq and Afghanistan. U.S. servicemen have fought and died defending freedom. In a ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery, President Barack Obama paid tribute to America's war dead. They are heroes, each and every one, he said. They gave America the most precious thing they had, their last full measure of devotion. And because they did, we are who we are today, a free and prosperous nation, the greatest in the world. In the past 10 years alone, about 2.5 million members of the Army, Navy, Marines, Air Force, Coast Guard, and related Reserve and National Guard units have been deployed in the Afghanistan and Iraq wars, according to the Defense Department records. Nearly 40,000 Americans have been deployed more than five times. And more than 400,000 have undergone three or more deployments. In that time, about 7,000 U.S. servicemen have died in Iraq and Afghanistan. The President also spoke about those who are currently on the front lines. We must remember our countrymen who are still serving, still fighting, putting their lives on the line for all of us. Hundreds of thousands of veterans have returned home after selflessly putting it all on the line for the country they love. The transition into daily life can be difficult under the best of circumstances. For the tens of thousands of veterans suffering from physical or mental injuries, the post-war care is all too often inadequate. An unprecedented number of veterans are facing the challenges of civilian life. We all need to redouble our efforts to honor these veterans who have returned home in the hopes of having productive and meaningful lives. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers, wrote William Shakespeare and Henry V. For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. Please rise if you have served in the United States Army.
High above us all, working tirelessly, are the pilots supported by tremendous ground crews of the United States Air Force. or no faces. They all just kind of blended together. I was born in an army base in Fort Riley, Kansas and lived on three different army bases. I spent the first, my first year of kindergarten in an army base in Baumholder, Germany, where they only spoke German. We attended parades and ceremonies and special events. All that camo stuff, marching in lines, sir, yes, sir, and you can't handle the truth. It makes for great scenes in movies, but I never met anything to me personally. I've gone to boot camp graduations for family members and for some of my friends. And even my own son's boot camp graduation in Paris Island in um, South Carolina. I watched these early morning runs and the endless drills and that pursuit of collective perfection. My son joined the ranks of the countless other brave men and women who gave up their freedom to protect mine. Men and women who lost time and friends, limbs, and innocence. Their sacrifice began with an oath, a pledge, a code. <coughs> Excuse me. Maybe even before that, it began with a heart to serve, a commitment to give, a promise to put all others first. And to these brave men and women, sons and daughters, brothers, sisters, husbands and wives, those who serve and give and sacrifice and protect, we thank you. Hmm. 
Thank you. Nothing prepared me for the most heartfelt thank you I have ever witnessed. My father is Jack Muncy, United States Army Korean War veteran, and proudly wears his hat to tell everybody. But my dad is sick. 16 month ago, months ago, in July of 2013, the doctor said that he was in stage four lung cancer and probably had about two years to get his affairs in order. One thing my dad wanted to do before he died was to see the Korean War Memorial in Washington, D.C. And so my husband and I drove down to Terre Haute, Indiana, picked up my mom and dad, and we had a family vacation in the D.C. area. The highlight of this trip was visiting the Korean War Memorial with my father, wearing that Korean War veteran hat. Freedom is not free. That's the theme of the memorial. Our nation honors her sons and daughters who, who answered the call to defend a country they never knew and a people they never met. That always bothered my dad, the part about a people that he had never met. In fact, when my dad met his cancer doctor, he was shocked to see that he was Korean. Still wearing that same old hat, the doctor stuck out his hand and he said, I see that you're a Korean War veteran. Thank you for your service. My dad's lip began to quiver and tears welled up in his eyes. The doctor could see that he was upset. I hope that it doesn't bother you that I am Korean. My dad's response was, Koreans, I, I killed so many of them. I only hope I didn't kill your father. The doctor was so kind to take time with him and to thank him on behalf of all South Koreans for his sacrifice and assured him that his father was still living thanks to his courageous efforts. My dad didn't speak much of the war, but when he became sick, it was like if he didn't tell his experiences, nobody would ever know what he went through. He told me of a time when his platoon was trapped. Just like in the movie, he said, we were soldiers. And everyone in that platoon died except for him and his best friend, Anderson. I remember my dad saying he couldn't understand why he didn't die that day, too. He told me of another time when he had been fighting night after night, and they had gone weeks without a shower. They were freezing cold, tired and thirsty and hungry. And they would spend hours digging foxhole and hunker down to shoot all night long at the enemy. He loved his BAR, his Browning Automatic Rifle, 30 cal. My dad was a sharpshooter in the team before the war, and he has won countless trophies for his excellent shooting skills. He told me about a night that he spent in a foxhole that continues to haunt him to this day. He remembers seeing men shooting machine guns in a foxhole next to him. And their guns would turn red from the heat of all the bullets passing through the barrel. He noticed the silence first, and then he looked over to see the men had all been killed. Dad's commanding officer told him to get in that foxhole and start shooting that machine gun. My dad didn't care much for shooting machine guns, so he asked the officer if he could just stay in his foxhole and continue shooting his BAR. He told my dad, in words that I can't repeat today, that he should kindly get over into that other foxhole, pick up that machine gun, and start shooting the enemy. So my dad followed his orders. A few short minutes later, a grenade landed in my dad's foxhole where he had been, and it was completely destroyed. He would have been killed instantly had he stayed. On June the 10th, in another foxhole, he and his best buddy, Anderson, Anderson asked him, my dad, to hand him another box of ammo. So dad leaned deep down into the foxhole, grabbed a green metal box of 30 cows, and started to hand it to his best friend until he saw that his face was gone. He had been shot in the head and killed. After the war, exactly one year to the date, my mom and dad were married on June the 10th. It was a happy day and a sad day. My dad never forgot the sacrifice of Anderson on that special day. I often heard him say, I just don't understand why he died, and I didn't. 
I'm glad that my dad could share some of these stories about the Korean War because when we visited the Korean War Memorial, it just made it that much more special. The Korean War Memorial is designed in the form of a triangle. And within this triangle are 19 stainless steel soldiers designed by Frank Gaylord, larger than life and nearly weigh over a thousand pounds. The figures represent a squad on patrol drawn from every branch of the armed forces that served in the Korean War. 14 figures are from the United States Army, three are Marine Corps, one is a Navy corpsman, and one is an Air Force forward air observer. They're all dressed in full combat gear, dispersed among the strips of granite and Jupiter bushes to represent the rugged terrain of Korea. Off to one side, the soldiers there, there is a 160-foot black granite wall created by Louis Nelson with over 2,000 photographic images sandblasted into it, depicting all the soldiers, equipment, and the people involved in the Korean War. When reflected on the wall, there appears to be 38 soldiers to represent the 38th parallel of Korea. There is a circle that contains a reflecting pool of remembrance. And right next to the pool, you will find the Rose of Sharon hibiscus plant, which is Korea's national flower. Engraved on the granite blocks near the water at the end, east end of the monument is a casualty statistics of all the soldiers who fought in the war. You will notice that there are 628,833 that are dead. Over a million were wounded. Over 93,000 were, cap were captured and 470,000 are missing. The day our family visited the Korean War Memorial, the designer himself, Louis Nelson, just so happened to be there giving a guided tour along with the park ranger. He said, talking about the wall and the faces on the wall and, and how they were sandblasted. And then he said, you will notice that all the name tags on the uniform and their dog tags have all been removed to show the individual faces would represent a collected unity of all the soldiers. Well, then my dad piped up. Well, this collected unit of a face is mine, and pointed to his, his, his image on the wall. It was an engraved image of a face that my dad had a photo of back home. And the people in the guided tour, they broke through the crowd, and they stuck out their hands to shake my dad's hand and thanked him for his service to our country. People of all ages, children and teens and older, older adults, they thanked him and thanked, thanked him for his service. This lady said that she is here at the memorial because her dad died in the war and she wanted to know if she could get her picture taken with my dad. And then something happened that I will never forget. This young Korean man came to my dad's wheelchair. He humbly knelt beside him so that he would not be taller than my dad. And he said, thank you for coming to Korea. I owe you so much. You came to strange country to help people you did not know. Your soldiers came from far away to help South Korea and save our family, and you saved my life. All the happiness and all the love I now enjoy came from your soldiers and the tears of the terrified. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your bravery and your courage should never be forgotten. Yes, it's true, people say Korean War is forgotten war, but it is not forgotten. It lives deep in our hearts. Thank you. And then the man asked if he could get his picture taken with my dad. And then the whole family wanted their picture taken with my dad. Notice the young teen. He did not want to cover up my dad's picture on the wall. I saw so much respect. I was totally amazed and so proud of my dad. I'm so glad that God orchestrated this moment in his life so his questions could finally be answered. Why didn't I die when my platoon was massacred? Why didn't I die in the foxhole instead of Anderson? Daddy, this is why so we could tell your story. Tell your story about an unknown Korean man who you saved. So thank you, Daddy, and thank you all of our honored veterans for your service. I encourage you, if you have not told your stories to others, write them down and share them so that we will never forget.
left their homes and families to defend the rights of all. Help to save our travel run so we can all be free. Fight on the battlefields, defending you and me.
great country, uh, and we have a lot of people to say thank you to, people who have given their lives throughout the years for our freedoms. But as a Christian school, it would be kind of negligent on our parts to not think of the one who has given his all for us for eternity, not just our country, but for all of eternity. And so we thank the Lord for the country he has given us, but we also thank him for the sacrifice that he gave to pay the penalty for our sins so that we can have eternal life. The Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due. So I'd like to once again to have our veterans stand, and let's give them a round of applause and again say thank you to you for your service. To our seated. This program is my favorite of the whole year. I like Christmas and all the Christmas stuff, but this is the one that I really look forward to. I think it's great. And all because of one person. And she now is over there signing to Richard, and that's Mrs. Brown. So let's give Mrs. Brown a round of applause. <laughs> This is not an easy time to get started with the school year and immediately got to jump into Veterans Day and Christmas is obviously just around the corner. Uh, I think things have already started popping up at Walmart for Christmas season is upon us. Um, but we thank you for her for the work that she's done. And of course, the young people, let's give them a round of applause. For the work. <laughs> 